have Harold Halfblad, who's visiting us from Paris. He'll talk about Hi. it. Thank you. And this is partly joint with uh, Mark Rajiville. I mean, at least, uh, but, but I will also talk about other things since then. Uh, and, and I will mention some new work by Cedric Villat. This is, you know. So much of what we do as analytic, as analytic number theorists are um, things that other people might identify with statistics. I mean, we look at averages, we look at correlations, autocorrelations. Uh, correlations are hard, right? So the motivation here is that estimate, you know, a large part of what is hard in analytic number theory is correlations. Say, that is this sort of thing. For two quote unquote arithmetic functions, where arithmetic just means a function of our, that is that that we care about on the interface. So one of the functions we care most about, well, we can care about it or about it. It's close, more than cousin. It's it's sibling. The Mobius function, it will be the Liouville function. So either the Liouville function or the Mobius function tell us when um, a number has an odd or an even number of prime factors, and that's the hardest thing to, to distinguish in the number city. That's hard to say. Some methods just cannot cope with that on the ground, that's precisely what they fail. So the Liouville function is just a function that takes a value of minus one if the number of prime factors considered with multiplicity is uh, odd and one if it is even. So how hard are these questions? So um, already if you look at the question of averages for the Liouville function, that's equivalent to the prime number theorem. So, in the late 19th century, people realized that back then. But if you ask yourself the most basic question, yes, with yes, the correlation between two things in this case, well, to show that this tends to zero, as it goes to infinity, this is open and very hard. Roughly as hard as twin prime or what have you. I mean, these are the, or well vast. Whether those two questions are really equivalent or th that's a different matter. But whether some are slightly harder than the others, I wouldn't. Uh, this talk is not about it. that, would be speculation. But it's part of conjecture in degree two. Um, so some. There have been several exciting developments since 2015 when Matamaki and Rajiville proved that lambda of n averages to zero on most uh, proportion going to one or, uh, of sh short intervals. And what is new here is not a statement of this. Sorry, this was known for short intervals, meaning into the one six, um, but what is now uh, what, what was new and exciting was that one could take much shorter intervals than that, so that they could take they showed that on average over you know integers of say about ten, <coughs> you average these things if you average things over intervals of length h, this will be oh, this is this level of one, meaning it goes to zero. Uh, provided simply that h goes to infinity, however slowly, as n goes to infinity. So this is true even if h goes like log 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 But even n to the epsilon, it was completely new. And so there have been all sorts of developments. And soon after that, uh, Tao proved using the material. <laughs> And then there was, it, said it reduces to that. Um, he proved a weak version of uh, of Chawla. So, put weights here this way. 
things with lower form. Uh, his method can be made, he didn't give a bound, but his method can be made to give a bound. Uh, this would be a constant times uh, log, 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 x to the fourth well, small power. Stuff. I will not repeat the stale joke from analytic number theorists. Um, so this is actually a couple of logs more than the drowning analytic number theorist. But so the first step of proof of those proof is um, that this statement here reduces to proving for some set of primes, really any set of primes that is thick enough for the sum of its reciprocals to converge. So L, the sum over that set of primes, one over P, P some set of primes. And yeah, P is taken, I mean, it's going to vary with L, but we'll assume that this goes to infinity as X goes to infinity. So uh, star reduces to say that on average, when you take the sum here for n going up to x, lambda n, and here lambda n plus p, and here p, my favorite set of primes, it is infinite to the So if you prove that. We summing p in p, one over p, how far? Uh, this is a fixed set of, all right, so. I should really say the set of primes can be anything for any given x. I just want to measure it by L. So it's a finite set. So that yeah, so this is this will be finite, but it was the set is a function of x. For any x, you go, you can choose whichever set you want. That's enough. Okay. So tau, so we are happy if even if so the devil doesn't get to choose a set of primes, we get to choose the set of primes. And and tau indeed doesn't tau doesn't show that this is true for any precise set of primes, he shows that there exists a set of primes for which this is true. And that's enough for, for his purposes. So, um, yeah, we would win. It's not too hard to see that if we could replace um, the condition P divides N by a way so why would we win? Because in that case, we would have a statement. If we have a weight one over P, then we have a statement that is quite similar to Matomaki Rajivil. And in fact, can be, yeah, it, it comes from their proof. It, it was shown in a joint paper by them before. It's not, it's, it's barely harder. But what does winning mean? Yeah. By winning, by winning, by winning, so winning meaning proving uh, okay. the theorem, which means proving this. So you you, uh, you 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 can prove this. So you, um, if I mean, let let us engage in some wishful thinking. If we could replace p divides n very naively by a weight one over p, then this would become a statement of Matomaki Rajivil, Rajivil type, which in fact can be proved using Matomaki and Rajivil tools and had already been. Um, so what Tao did was he showed that there exists some sufficiently thick P, it's actually not very thick, but some sufficiently thick P um, for which this is actually the case, for which this can be done without changing things too much. Yeah, but then when one can ask several questions, so, so this was done, uh, I mean, the flavor, the soft flavor as well as the bounds uh, make sense when you realize that, it, yes, so he's, he's using an, um, an argument which is no, certainly completely novel within analytic number theory, uh, uh, the method of exhausting entropy. He's basically saying, so he has some mutual information, is this course uh, way of quantifying a correlation. Well, I, I really the the fact so p divides n and the values of lambda are not independent. So, um, 
<laughs> but um, you can see their lack of independence if you put it in terms of entropy. Entropy is additive. And so if you have something additive, you can really see it as I have a pot of lentil soup. And, um, you know, the more I get, the fewer lentils there are, somebody's going to get mostly broth. So there's going to be some set of primes for which there's, there's not that P divides N does not have that much to do with lambda of N times lambda of N plus P. It's really at that level, and it's very nice that it works out. Um, but you can say several things here that you would like to have better bounds. That's what the mandating number series would say. Uh, but also, one could say, well, uh, it's very nice that it's enough to show that um, uh, that uh, there is some p for which this is the case, and then you are done. But can you prove it for some specific p? Can you prove it for all p of a certain kind? with some very general conditions? And the answer is yes. And so here is where the... So is there another way? Well, let me define a graph, which is already implicit in, in the work of Matt Mackey, Rajivi, et tal. Um, the, the, I have just simplified it. This is best, but... So the vertices are just integers between n and 2n. The edges. So I'm going to draw an edge between two vertices. So I, I draw in this version of the proof, I will draw only edges of prime length. Um, they, they will be the primes in my set P. But as I will actually fulfill my promise. So what, what I will do here, will be true for all sets of primes with some mild conditions. So um, here I'm going to draw an edge if and only if P divides n. So this is my graph down. I have just drawn one edge in it, but that's what an edge looks like. You draw an edge <laughs> if its length divides the vertices. Well, one of the vertices and the other one as well. And so um, Tao already said uh, in one of his, in his paper proving that, that uh, the, well, basically my paraphrase would be that it would be natural to try to prove that this graph fulfills some sort of expander property. Uh, and then everything would follow. But he says he doesn't know of any techniques that, that exist for this. So, I mean, what, what we did was develop those techniques and prove things. But first, I, I as Peter said, I should not assume that everybody knows everything. And in fact, it's better to know less uh, because, you know, I have to change definitions a bit. So now so it's some sort of expanded property, some sort, and that's that's right. But it's not sort of expanded property. Well, what is an expanded graph property? Uh, well, I will be a bit more precise about this and about how we have to modify the definition. But the, the kind of property it is, it is a property of the spectrum of a linear operator on functions. Not on the set of vertices and have that, according to the complex numbers. And there are two very concrete, there are three equivalent definitions of this. Basically, this is one of them, which is very useful and the one we will use. But one way to have a reality check is to say that this is roughly equivalent. In fact, if you define your words precisely, it's exactly equivalent to random walks at this root here. It's not quite equivalent if you use quickly in the in equidistribute, I mean, the degree of equidistribution exactly the same way that is most common in the study of random walks, but it's, this is close enough uh, to tell us that we have to modify the definition. Um, but why do we have to modify the definition? Uh, because to start with, um, for Chinese remainder theorems uh, reasons, uh, the primes in P cannot be too big. They will have to be relatively small compared to L. Uh, tau considers only very short edges, like smaller than log of N. We managed to go so for us, P in P, um, yeah, we, we, we have something much softer, but still it's there small compared to it. So the edges in this graph are short. 
So there is no way you can equidistribute quickly everywhere. However, you can hope, you know, if you get if you get drunk somewhere in Princeton Town, you can hope to be equidistributed in this general neighborhood, so you can have some sort of local equidistribution. And the question is whether you can translate that intuition or have some parallel for that intuition in the spectral side, and you can. So um, at the same time, so these are short aim for local if you distribution. Also, there are going to be some bad vertices, like what if any is a prime, then the degree is zero. They're not going to go anywhere. So you also look for an A at almost everywhere property. But you want more than expansion, because expansion, we will state things more precisely in a moment, is really about having a little gap. Whereas here we want much more of a gap. We want the eigenvalues of our, of an, of our operator to be little O of the degree, at the very least. <clears throat> so we, we, we have to weaken things in two ways and strengthen them in another. Okay, so we want eigen, the eigenvalues of whatever operator we chose, you cho we chose to be little O of the degree. So let me be more precise about what we what we want. So uh, the key in an expanded graph property is really the adjacency operator at gamma. So what is at gamma? Uh, so it turns a function into another function like it. So at gamma of f, this new function, its value at the vertex will be the sum. So your new value will be the sum of the values of your neighbors. Very good. Um, and what, so the way I'm going to cope with these things is um, I'm going to define a naive model for the graph. Uh, and the naive model is, as you might expect, the graph where you always have an edge, but it has, instead of a condition, it has a weight one over t. Um, and now um, we want to show, so we studied the spectrum. <clears throat> of the difference of these two abuses. And by the way, the usual expansion in the, the usual expansion can be put in this framework. I haven't seen it being put in this framework, but it's trivial to put it in this frame, framework. The a prime, your naive model, is just a complete graph. And then, then it becomes clear, you know, how this is a modification of the usual expansion. Uh, also, in the usual expansion, you just need, as I said, that um, the eigenvalues are at most one minus epsilon times the, the degree. In our case, it's an average degree because we don't have the early degrees not constant. The average degree is actually a row friend LT. So, why do you say in the usual expansion, you take the difference between adjacency operator with complete graph? You can. I'm saying that I've never seen that written down that way, but it's it's very very easy to put to to say it in that way. Yes. Why is that true? What? I don't. I don't follow. I don't. I don't understand why this is true. What What does it say? The agency C operator. So the okay. graph is the orthogonal projection of the constants. So you are just removing the the top okay. value, okay. and you, okay. you have only that. Okay. okay. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, I, I said it's unfamiliar, yes, but once you think about it, then it's true. Well, it's true even if you don't think about it, but yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I still have to modify the definition a little. As I said, I have to aim for an almost everywhere property, taking out some bad vertices, but that's fine. That doesn't change your conclusion. Uh, we must exclude some vertices. So we define our operators to be A, these, and then we have to exclude some vertices. Some bad vertices. Say those, actually those of degree zero are not as bad as those of degree, um, of very high degree. Say numbers that have a lot of prime factors, many more than the average. Those are really bad. Those, those, was, those ruin your spectrum, spectrum completely. So those you have to exile. They are not the only ones, but 
So we'll work with some restriction. Oh, this is a restriction uh, with, uh, you know, uh, the complement is small. So we're just taking out a few nasty vertices. Uh, and that's fine. You, you will still get, in, in fact, by, by this point, you, you use the multiplicativity, multiplicativity of lambda only at the, this very first step. In fact, it has average zero. This is, yeah, the, the, all, all that I'm saying is true much more generally and works much more generally, but I think it's clearest when I say it in terms of lambda. Um, so I main theorem is that for any set of primes P in a big interval, this is not important, but it goes up to, actually it's for some people in the audience who know the field well, they will, will know that this is a critical value, whether that's a fact of nature or a fact about us, doesn't, I, I do not know, but it's, it's good that H can be as big as this. Uh, and I love H zero, so H zero should not be too small, Though again, that's probably just an artifact of the proof. We want to avoid very small primes because they are a mess. So A is above. So this is, this is going to be true for any set of primes P in this interval. And you know, L is above, you're going to have the yeah. exist X a set of brightness with with small complement. such that every eigenvalue of A restricted to X is small. Not just little O of L, which would be enough for a result numbers here, but in fact, as good as it can be, up to a constant factor, O of square root of. <clears throat> so sort of O of average degree was, was L, right? L, yes. So it is O of Ramana, yes. Okay. And what is small? Small. Well, when there's a uh, small here, meaning um, e to the minus a million L's, I'm saying. I don't care how many zeros. Okay. Okay. So, so the actual of, of this small being pretty small is that this is actually, this gives you consequences for functions that are not even bounded. But lambda is bounded, so. All right, so some immediate corollary. So this is really the main theorem. Everything else is that I see it as corollaries. Uh, so a corollary. So what is P, is there, is P the set of all primes there or something? Any prime, the devil chooses a set of primes. So it could be a set of essentially constant size. Yeah, but then the, the result would be meaningless because the- um, Large constant size. It would still be, if your constant is larger than the one implicit here, then it, that would be meaningful, those sort of useless, yes. Okay. Um, no, I, I think that, that that large constant size would definitely be meaningless. If L is a large constant, it's sort of useless, but meaningful, <clears throat> yes. Okay. Okay, so first of all, we do get a stronger version. So, so the, the statement with the talk about, uh, about positive and negative eigenvalues? Yes, 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 yes. See, I, uh, it's the operator norm. Yes, the operator norm, exactly. I, I just put absolute values around the eigenvalue. No, this is fine. Yes. So, first of all, we do get a much stronger bound for now. Only an analytic number theory, so it can't be strong. This has been improved since then. Um, well, Tal had proved what I said, and then Tal and Tarabainen together uh, managed to go down to three logs. But it's, uh, it's two logs, more about that in a moment. And, and you have a stronger corollary, which is also analogous to some things that Tal and Tarabainen had together. Which this has strong Charlie is true at almost all scales. <clears throat> in in you know, in almost all, all ranges in a logarithmic sense. Um very good. 
why you're writing. Well, actually, I, I should really put one of it. So, so the, this was known to Town Teravinen, but it's known to Town Teravinen, but we we get stronger bounds. But if for me to write a stronger bounds, I would have to define what I mean at that almost almost scale of name. Yes, I would much rather answer the question that is being asked. Sorry, where's the, the, where's the scale in the statement? What is the scale x or the scale is so x is one scale, x over two is at a different scale. X over three is the different scale. So there may be a few nasty ranges, but logarithmically speaking, they are rare. Sorry, okay. that's a statement about Charla, not logarithmic Charla. Exactly. Okay. But the town and Avinen also have a signal. Oh, yeah. uh, but yeah, then the bounds become stronger, but yes. But logarithmic Charla is true for all X. Yeah. Yes. So let me divide. Okay, I can give. We did have lots of other corollaries, but I think it's more exciting that there's a recent development. Namely, um, Cedric Pilat, who is uh, James Maynard's student, um, has the following. So um, he considers so that our result is optimal for, for the graph that you have, but um, if you consider essentially the same graph, the graph like Gamma or essentially uh, gamma again, but you allow yourself non prime edges. So instead of, um, so D can be any rough number uh, with a nice factorization. Though again, that's inessential. That's just so that the proof doesn't become too complicated, I think. So rough number, non necessarily prime, meaning a number without small prime divisors. So P1 is at most um, H, uh, H0, uh, is at least H0. And then just to simplify things, because things are complicated enough as they are, he assumes that these are in, in dyadic ranges, that these two dyadic ranges of P2, let's say yeah, at least to P1, it's not exactly that, but it, it's very simple and not so important. Um, so he proves that in this case, uh, again, every eigenvalue, he doesn't get quite uh, square root of L, I, and I don't think he was aiming for that, but he gets actually L to the three fourths. And, and the advantage is that now, because he considers not just primes, but rough numbers, the sum of the reciprocals is much larger. And so if he gets as an immediate corollary, so just like Tau and uh, managed to gain one log over tau, uh, so he has managed to gain a log of S. So he gets um, again logarithmic Chawla. So he gets some small power of log <laughs> alpha. Uh, it's small because of his assumption of nice factorization. Um, and, and he also gets the analogous result at almost all scales. Uh, not right. I mean, it's <clears throat> I can talk more about um, where the real difference lies at the end. I mean, the, 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 the same strategy works. Um, but but it's, it's, you know, it's it, it will be a yeah, it would be a very good, uh, it would be a very strong thesis in my view, but he he, he, he insists that his thesis work is still in the future. Um, or, I, or maybe he just likes it in his college. Um, at any rate. So other than the <clears throat> exponent there, you shouldn't be able to hope to get any, can you hope to get anything better than a... Yeah, yeah, you, you should be able to get, it should be true with set to the one half. Yeah. Um, and here, it should be true. All right, I, I don't want to get into small prime factors. That's masochism, but you probably can can do without the assumption of um, of nice factorization, which is each prime moving in some direction. Yes, I'm asking about the corollary. Oh, so like here. So these methods of proof uh, would would should give a, a bigger alpha. How big? I, I do not know. I don't know. Uh, people will work on it. Maybe. So he, his alpha, he hasn't made it explicit. It's probably about one one thousand. Maybe one can go up to one tenth or one six. I do not know. Maybe there will be a polymath project. Probably not. 
But um, do, are you asking what can be proved with these methods? I mean, are there lower bounds on this as you vary x? That's a very good question. And I actually, um, I, I would guess, my, my guess, but you know, it's an old man's intuition is that this is bounded by one over an arbitrary power of log. But I mean, remember that all of these, all of these things are true more generally for um, non-pretensions multiplicative functions. <clears throat> and, and I'm not sure that, that, that those strong bounds would be true for, in fact, I, I was talking to, Miguel was just telling me to be careful about this. Uh, so it's not just as this strategy has to stop at a certain point, but any strategy this general should should have its limits. All right. So let's go to the main ideas of the proof. Uh, and towards the end, so I will say where Pilate really different. So many ideas of the proof. So the first step, I am amazed that people sometimes are surprised or think this difficult or important. I will call it step zero. It's it's if if you work on this problem, it's obvious from the start that something morally or some weaker version of step zero should be true. But uh, okay, and in fact, it's the last thing I did. Uh, but if there exists a large eigenvalue. People are familiar, people who work on KD graphs are familiar with this necessary step that if there exists a large eigenvalue that, that is not trivial because of high multiplicity, well, it has high multiplicity because everything yeah. has, and so it counts a lot towards the trace. Here you don't have any sort of symmetry like in a, in a KD graph, you cannot assume high multiplicity. However, it is true that if there is a large eigenvalue, there are many large eigenvalues. So let me state first the graph reason, then I can modify my statement a bit. And then I, I could, I could uh, sketch a proof. There are several ones right now. So the reason is really locality. I mean, just the, the fact that the edges are short, which was a pain before, but in fact, it saves us here. So it's, it, it's, it solves the problem it, it, it itself creates. Um, so I said through each because X can change a little. X can become a bit larger because of this step. That is, what, what it's really true is that if there exists, so either either you can kill all large eigenvalues by making the, the, by taking a few more things out of X, or you find out that there are many eigenvalues. Now the statement sounds less um, surprising. I, we can go over proofs at the end if there's time, unless people, let's make this interactive. Do people want to see a sketch of a proof of this? Yeah, Probably I not. I prefer to see how you control that eigenvalue. Okay, very good. Much better. And because there are many such large eigenvalues, we managed to show then that if there exists a large eigenvalue, the power of the trace. Of course, this is an ancient completely ancient technique. If there, uh, yeah, there's a large eigenvalue, in fact, many of them, then their contribution to the trace of a higher power must be large. So the, the, our job is really to, to bound this, the trace of a large power. So if you have played with graphs, you recognize that the trace of a high power of an operator, which is defined in terms of the identity operator, is, is a, it's a sum over a closed path, no, in, inner weighter, yeah, inner weighted graph, gamma minus gamma prime, uh, of lengths. Okay, so by a closed path, I mean just a path that, that ends where it starts. So we're, we're basically, we're soon going to be just counting such such paths. Should the 2k be inside the trace? Sorry? The exponent 2k. She be taking it. Yeah, or, or in like next to standard one. Oh, so yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Sorry, I, I'm my. <laughs> Everybody's happy. Yes. So, um, 
I, I'm not counting paths quite yet because yeah, there will be trivially be a lot of them. Just that there's a, there's a step before I start counting paths. Um, it's just that because this is this is a weighted graph where many of the edges have negative uh, weights, or and some others have large positive weights because the edge weights here are zero or one. And here the weights are one over two. So you're going to have cancellation, and that's really important. Otherwise, it would be hopeless. So um, there, why not? So there's going to be cancellation if, um, in fact, it's not hard to see. Again, an exercise to take home that if uh, x were all of the interval n comma two n, there will be total cancellation as soon as there is even. Yes, one edge length that appears only once in the in your path. So if you have if you have some sort of path here, um, and sometimes may repeat, but there is at least one path, one length that say P four that appears only once, then that's enough for the contribution of this path as you vary n to contribute zero. That's not quite the case anymore, the moment you take out some nasty vertices, but it's close enough. So there's going to be cancellation if there are many uh, primes P i in the path appear only once. And, and many is not even that many. So certainly if a proportion at least epsilon appears at most once, you win by a large margin. But it's a nice exercise to see that if effects were all of the interval, then this is, is easily true. But you have to write it down. Um, step two, you actually have to, to get rid of the nasty primes. So I say, what is a, a path is just a level? A path, yes. A cycle with these labels? Yes. Well, the, these labels are just the length of the, of the edges, yes. You say you have lots of constellations when you, you put this. Uh, if, if, if it, this this graph it appears at many different places. I, I, uh, well, you can just shift this. Uh, as I said, the, um, think of this. The, the, this graph is really almost a complete graph, just with with um, with weights and um, uh, usually very small weights. So the point is that if at least one of these lengths. So so forget about x for a moment. I see. Forget about the step I'm about to take. Say I don't take out any nasty vertices. Then, if at least one of these prime length, one of these lengths of edges appears only once, say seventeen appears as a length, it's a, it's a length of exactly one of of these edges in this path. Then, as I as I vary the starting point, so n, because this is n n plus p one, n plus p two, p one plus p two, you know, as I vary. Um, n, the contribution of these paths to the sum will be almost zero. There will be total cancellation, simply because of this very naive thing that that uh, if you take a number n at random, the probability that it will be divisible by p is one over p, almost exactly. Yeah, by total cancellation, I mean much more than you have a constant. In, uh, it's it's total cancellation. Okay. Uh, Things get more complicated because of the step I'm about to take, which I have to take. So it's a necessary step that unfortunately solves some issues and may up some others without ruining them. So you have to, um, so yeah, you remove, as I said, you really have to remove the vertices with very high degree, we see much higher than average, otherwise you, you are, you're done for. Because the, 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 there's going to be eigenvalues of size at least square root of the maximum degree. So it's clear you have to, to kill yes. some of those uh, vertices with very high degree, but then there's something subtler and more difficult to, to deal with. <clears throat> you also have to avoid um, small cycles uh, and there, there, there is not, not uh, it's not hard to show that that small cycles, certainly cycles of constant size, of constant length, 
I, I, by, by, yeah, by cycles, I just mean closed paths uh, of constant length. Uh, well, that you go over and over, that those also ruin your eigenvalues, because if you have two of those, you can switch between them and it's going to be a horrid mess. So like, this is a comment, but <clears throat> both these ideas are also in like Gordon Al's proof of here. Like, I, 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 I was actually, after we got done with that, I was, I was looking at that and trying to use it to simplify it. So like both the thing were like you, you, you center the random variables to get cancellation, right? This, this also appears in that proof. Uh, that I didn't catch. I just tried over more enough, but it was I. It was my strong feeling that there are some elements in common, and that um, one can probably simplify all of this a bit by by you know if an expert who is more in the sort of mathematics that Bordenau do, does reads this yeah. paper and writes it. Yes, I, I think you're completely and absolutely correct. It's uh, just it's not. Yeah, I'm probably not the best person to simplify my own stuff, but, uh, and, and also for several reasons. Yes. In the same direction, like. I know you probably don't care about like actually getting down to optimal spectral gap, but you, you, you often do better if you use non-backtracking operator instead of... I, I thought about that too. I thought that would help me in major ways. If it didn't help me in major ways, you are hardly invited to try to simplify the problem. Uh, let me go on, but that's a very... Those, I, completely agree with your, I completely agree with your first point, and your second point is extremely reasonable. I think the answer is no, but maybe I was just stupid. But um, the problem is that, okay, uh, the usual non backtracking operators are no longer symmetric, and, and that that's a mess. But by all means, try. But yes. Um, very good. So um, we have to avoid small cycles. We have to take, so yes, we just remove, again, we just remove the vertices that cause them. That are containing them. and. So this is necessary, and another thing that I do not know whether it's necessary, but uh, it's something extremely helpful, and you can do it in this more or less the same way that you avoid small cycles, is to avoid early recurrences. Uh, meaning that when you have, you know, a prime links PI, and then you have some other lengths, and then after a very short while, uh, you you have a reappearance, your, your prime P comes back after too short a while. I, uh, uh, that messes up things, better not. So it's actually very easy to show that these nasty vertices are in a small minority. But then um, to keep those, to taking out those vertices from messing up your cancellation argument, you have to show that they are well distributed in arithmetic progressions. That's painful. Uh, so how to show bad vertices? So far, you haven't used much about the primes or subs or anything. I'm about to do something. Uh, are well distributed. Uh, actually, number theory comes really in this step. Uh, hard to think number theory comes up only in this step. So um, in this case, the is in high degree. That's fairly routine, analytic number theory. It's also where there's a minor mistake in the, in the paper in the archive. I have noticed, Cedric noticed, and he fixed it in his master's thesis. We have other ways to fix it. It's not serious, don't worry. Um, more interesting, uh, I would say, is that, um, yes, how to cope, how to do this sort of thing. Because there, there um, so there's this new tool that we, that we developed. Um, um, Newish, in the sense that when you come right down to it, you have a sieve problem, but a sieve problem that is funny in a way, because usually, you should, in a usual sieve, you have some conditions. You want to, to deal with some ends um, that uh, you want to take out the ones that, that are in some bad congruence classes, right? So you want to ensure things like this. Etc. Okay, but traditionally in sieves, it has always been prime moduli. And we have to cope with composite moduli. And it amazes me that, I mean, this sort of problem must have come up, but I've never seen it in my life. I was unable to find it. I asked in a mass overflow. But we had to develop um, a variant of Brun sieve, basically, that deals with this. 
And there's some, some nice combinatorics. Well, it's nice standard combinatorics. So uh, the thing is, if you just try to do things as in Brunsky, if you have a combinatorial explosion, but then you tame it using the same new, uh, the same Möbius that appears in the sieve, and then you, you have a uh, Rotas Kraskot CRM coming to the rescue, and everything works out. So, variant. But okay, can you state that in our statement that you? Yes, I do so in the paper. I didn't have it in my notes, but yeah, uh, I think it's nice, but it would not be considered nice by people, non sieve people. But but yes, we have a general sieve yeah, for this. Something that would look like. A Brun sieve, but with arbitrary modular. Yes, uh, I. We can look at it later, and if you don't like it well enough, I can simplify it for you or or improve it. If it's of interest, I can work further on it. I, I'm pretty happy with with what's done, but. Um, yeah. That's. Um, yeah, I, I, it is stated in the paper in a fully general or general enough. Form. Okay. So the, yeah, the analytic number theory really comes here in, in, in checking the things on the coin straight. The heart of the proof is really combinatorics plus basic linear algebra and really basic geometry of numbers. And this is what's coming now. And I still have five minutes. Let me see, please. Five to seven minutes. Or say at least ten minutes. minutes. Excellent. This is wonderful. So the main part of proof. So we've dealt with the cancellation business, the main part of proof. So bound the number, just the number of closed paths. Well, number, it will be a weighted number, but more about that in a moment. With no other recurrences. A few non-repeated primes. And, and we're going to give them a small weight um, if they have many or even just a few uh, bad edges. Some i, I mean, are, I are bad, meaning just that they are not in the, they are edges that were not in the original graph gamma, just in the naive graph gamma. In fact, for, for simplicity in what remains of the exposition, you will. You, you will not be lying to yourself if you just ignore this and just require all the indices to be good. Say we're just counting close paths in the original gram, uh, graph gamma uh, with no early recurrences in that sense. Make sense? Some, some sense, it's somewhere. Uh, and not few non repeated. So you're just counting close paths. And, and if things are good, what happens if things are good? So if you have a repeated prime, then Almost all primes repeat just after a little while. And I and I prime my good. Then uh, you know that's just make me make, make me let me make the really, really, really trivial observation that you know you're going to have the sigmas are just signs, but let me just write plus to simplify, but some of the pluses could be minus. So you are going to have that this divides the sum. And pi prime divides the same sum but going up to pi prime minus one. And so, obviously, uh, since this is one and the same prime, it has to divide the difference. So pi has to divide the sum from well, pi plus pi plus one up to pi prime minus one. So you're going to have this divisibility relation. So you're really counting primes. Um, so uh, that, that you know, close paths which satisfy these invisibility relations. So how are you going to count it? So let's let's abstract things a bit. We will consider the shape of a walk. Walk close path, same thing. The shape of a close path. What do I mean by the shape? It's it's very. Is I really mean that just yes, that um, the shape will be an equivalence relation and, and the signs, the signs that I omitted here, plus or minus for each prime. So signs are just yes, plus or minus, and um, two indices are equivalent simply if uh, pi is 
here. No? And then um, we can sum over all works of that shape or count all works of that shape that are, yeah, we, we, we can, if you want, yes, let's just find the good ones, the ones that are respected in these relations. So sum count works of that shape. And I said, for simplicity, let's assume that everything's good. The, the, the ones that are not good get penalized. So what you have is this, all of these specific relations. So you have one divisibility relation for each pair of equivalent things. Uh, you can, I mean, it's almost like a linear system. It's a, yeah, it, it is a linear system, but of divisibility, it's not of equations. So you have one big matrix. I there is some divisibility relations here. You want to, if you want. I want P A two, etc. So the idea is just so um the idea just to find um a large uh, yes, find a submatrix. It's a bit of a mess because the same primes appear in here and as it is divisibility things. Uh to simplify matters, let me just say that I will find uh, find a submatrix with disjoint uh, row and column indices, so that those don't get mixed. Uh, with large rank. And it turns out that will usually be possible. There are some shapes for which that's not possible, but one shows that those shapes are rare. Those, those, sh those shapes are going to be of a very specific. Now, it's clear that some shapes will be nasty. Why? Because the following is a valid closed path, just a tree. And that imposes no, no non trivial divisibility relations whatsoever. But trees are not that common. I mean, there are not so many trees. Of course, there are other paths like that, but it, they will turn out to not to be that common either. There are paths with small rank rather than zero rank, but still. So, um, let me go very quickly. I cannot really give all of the combinatorial um, details. And besides, that's a part of the proof that changes perceptively in um, in Pilat's, in Pilat's work. The rest, he, he works, and Pilat does very good work. But the, the, uh, that's actually the heart of the proof, and this part of the heart of the proof, though I'm very fond of it, it's something that, that is modified in Pilat's work. Though, yeah. But I also have finite time. I would love to explain this over a cup of coffee. It's the best context in which one can explain something combinatorial. Um, let me just draw a different graph, and that will be give you enough an idea. I will define a new graph, uh, depending just on the um, equivalence relation, whose vertices are, I will lie a little, they are equivalence classes. Um, what's a little lie is really the equivalence classes that don't disappear when you reduce the path. Reducing meaning as you reduce a word. So the tree will be completely reduced. So the edges, so let me actually tell the truth in writing that do not vanish after reduction. So the edges are, and I will lie a little because of reduction, but if the word is reduced, it's true, um, between adjacent uh, conjugate classes, the ones that have representatives that are adjacent. So you, you can have a graph like this. It will be something like that. Okay, so what is the combinatorial heart of the proof then becomes? And let's see combinatorial because after that, once you, you you've got, once you do your combinatorics, then the rest is just a very trivial geometry of numbers and really brutal linear algebra with a, one very brutal linear algebra lemma, and that's something that Pilat noticed, and I will say a couple of words after that. The brutal linear algebra lemma being that if you have a matrix where every row has um, non-zero entries, uh, uh, at least one non-zero entry, and every column has at most kappa uh, non-zero entries, and the rank is at, is at least n over kappa, something as brutal as that. That's the, the it's even more brutal than the geometry of numbers involved. So the height here is really to show that um, 
the combinatorial card, which is not hard, hard ones to do it, is that um, it's enough to find um, a, a, to partition the vertices into blue and red, or really blue, red, and yellow because of reduction, but never mind, are connected. So, so find a partition. So vertices partition them in blue and red. And you want key blue. Well, it's really blue that matters because key blue, so key blue is connected and has a large boundary. And then the, the rank will be basically at least the size of the boundary. And the, for that, actually, that was a clue given to me by, I think, Filia Petrov on Math Overflow, that, that there's a very simple way once you get there uh, to, um, to simplify things because you, it's enough to have a spanning tree. And you have to find the blue ones to be. Uh, I, I should really give enormous credit to Math Overflow for helping me a lot when I was stuck. And everybody. <laughs> It's that individual in paper. So, and when do you have a, a spanning tree with many vertices? Almost always. You all you need, and well, I had to modify a standard resulting graph theory in some trivial ways to give the following. So, if there are at least um, m vertices in G of degree um, greater than two. Then, there, then, then yes, then you can find blue with, uh, you know, boundary. You're talking about the combinatorial theorem that giving low rank for the number of spanning trees under some. Oh, yeah, yeah, yes, the, the existence of a spanning tree with many leaves. Uh -huh. So there's a standard theorem in group theory, which was proving disturbingly late in the 80s by several people, um, that says that if you have a graph, where every vertex has at least uh, degree, has a degree at least three, then the, uh, there is a spanning tree uh, uh, with at, at least m over four leaves, or m is the number of nodes. Here I'm just softening it in a trivial way. I'm saying, no, some may have degree uh, two or one. I'm just required that many have degree at least two. And then I'm happy. So even if m is not that large, I'm completely happy, and the rank is large enough, and everything is beautiful. So the point is then, what remains? I said that there will be some bad paths, but show that paths where that is not the case, so where you have a funny sort of degenerate graph where almost every vertex has degree two or less, but those are rare. But that's not hard because um, the, the point is that those paths correspond to words that can be easily described. So they can be described in a telegram of, bound, of a given length with a bounded alphabet, right? So it, they correspond to words uh, where every time that V appears, only two neighbors are allowed. V may appear several times, but it always has the same two neighbors, every one, every one, every two. And, and those words, it's not hard to show that the number, yeah, it's, it's, they can be described with a, with a bounded alphabet. Um, then it gets things a bit, bit, a bit messy because of reduction, which I have omitted, but you can still do it. Then, then you're basically having an interpreter that is not a finite state machine, but that can read these words with a finite alphabet and reconstruct your word and your path, and so it's fine. Um, that, that's the, the, the one. I have a, a, an expository paper with an elephant in it. That's the role of the elephant. If you haven't read it, it doesn't matter. It's in Kant. I did my best to explain the paper um, in the Kant proceedings. So that, that's it. You win. And so what does Gilad do differently? So he has to take care of many things, but then in the combinatorial part of the proof, the system of the facility looks Sorry, scary. Where, where, where was the geometry of numbers? Uh, very, very simply, that when you have uh, a, a, a submitted with large rank, that, we, uh, uh, that uh, there will be few tuples of primes that satisfy the divisibility relations. Really pr brutal and primitive geometry of numbers. I mean, you, you do it just by mapping one box to another. It's, it's, I mean, if, you have to be a little bit careful, but it's, it's solved in two paragraphs. So 
So uh, Pivac here, um, um, this system will start to look horrid if you allow non-prime moduli, but then he realized that the key is that our use of linear algebra was, I said it verbally, was so brutal that really we were being too fancy by talking about rank. What we are really doing is implicitly we are constructing vectors that are obviously linearly independent. And so that's all he needs to do. Uh, and well, that still takes work, but something roughly, there are some differences, but he manages to do that. Uh, so I, 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 I should point people to the paper, but um, yeah, so the, this, this heart here changes and some things appear again. I would say he still has the elephant, but um, more complicated. System, yeah. But once you know that there's that a brutal, brutal linear algebra is enough, then you know that you're actually we're actually doing something more, more concrete than what we were saying. So produce. It's, I mean, obviously, obviously, once you do the combinatorics, combinatorics still the independent vector. So the combinatorics is more complicated. Okay, so that's where we are at. So what is the next step? Um, well, the next step was what Pilat did, but uh, that's great, it's done. Um, of course, people can improve on the exponent. Another, so to anticipate the, the, the audience's questions, uh, one question would be, what about higher correlations like this? Or, or you know, something that cannot be done by ergodic methods would be this. Um, I don't, so I've tried this. Uh, I've come up with empty hands. Uh, I don't think this. So, in order to deal with this, you would have to deal with hypergraphs and tensors. And even before I got into this, some specialist in tensors or telling me tensors were created by the devil. Don't go in there. And there's this theory of higher order expanders. I, I, I mean, I, I went over this in a graduate seminar, and I cannot see that working. You're, you're welcome to try it, but. Um, what I think is more hope. I think there's more hope in going. Uh, in there, there are other. There are more general statements than what the corollaries have stated here, that you, that you can get by painfully modifying the graph, or maybe not so painfully in the future. You know, you can put some exponential phases. This is all non-trivial. Again, you know, these are good problems. So it's clear you can get more out of the method by changing the weights and getting other statements. So I really think that. Going towards what's known as a fully uniformity conjecture uh, in this way, combining it with other ideas, is a more promising route than trying to go for something higher dimensional directly by considering hypergraphs. Any questions for Harold besides the he already asked? So. <laughs> Was that a bad move? Uh, I think Miguel, you mentioned in a, in a reading seminar that uh, these methods, what, what do you get on Fourier uniformity just with EA and alpha? Um, you mentioned they work. What, what, what is, that's a, a very good question. That's a, a problem I want to give to a former student of mine. So that, that I, I believe my intuition, my intuition is that if you put E and alpha for alpha a constant thing, that after a lot of work, you're going to be able to prove that. But I'm, I'm, I'm going to- Maybe right now, I'm just asking. Okay, so this is not proved. And, and maybe if you're nice, uh, wait until I actually email. Uh, okay, if you don't want to talk about it, then. Okay, that's fine, that's fine, that's fine. You don't want to so, I will say, so, what, what, so question. So one question, the next natural generalization will be, uh, what about, yes. Yeah, yeah. But no, I think something stronger can be proved. I think even this, with constant alpha, can be proved for it. I, I, I believe that this is a doable problem. I don't know the solution already. This is not a result, but I think a, a strong young person can prove this. That that this is little of you know like fixing alpha. Hmm? Yeah, I'm fixing alpha. We fix alpha. Yeah, you, you can do this. So this is Korean uniformity will be um Perfect. as this, but with variable alpha varying oh, yeah, yeah, uh, per, per interval. Yes. Um so um, whether one can put absolute values here, that's that's another question, but um, maybe one can, but 
I can see this being this working out. My intuition is that this is a fair problem to give to a strong young person with fixed alpha. Then, then variable alpha, you know, that's that's a challenge for. Okay, yes. Is the alpha alpha <laughs> Where does the alpha go into the graph? Like well, you have to. You have to. The, 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 yeah, it, it's going to affect the edges. Yes. Goes into the book. Yeah. Yeah. Wait. It's not trivial because it, this gets modified in this the first step by tau, which is a one step that we conserve from tau. This this alpha the alpha ends all gets messed up by being because n gets multiplied by, or rather it gets divided by p. But there are different ways to cope with that. You see the first step when when how do we go to these graph problems? It um, we are really multiplying n and n plus one both by p. And then this alpha gets multiplied by p. So this is going to mess this messes up the faces, but in a way that I believe can be dealt with. So there's the exponent three quarters in the lots results in the upper bound on the eigenvalues rather than root out in that result. Yes. I think if he if he works harder, he will get into the one half, but you know, you have to stop at a certain point, and he I think he, his result is excellent as it is. Okay, okay. So it's not some essential. Not, I mean, like, if it were trivial, he would have done it. Yeah. yeah. But so like, if one tries to execute his result with products of two primes rather than uh, log log. Very good. I think I think you're still okay. We we can sit down and do it. I haven't done it. Okay. That's actually a very good question. And, and a great warm up exercise for exercise. These are hundred page papers in most cases. If not. Not for the easily tired. I was exhausted when I was at this time. All right. Let's thank Carol again. <laughs>